Hi everyone, this is Dr. Kim. So today I want to take a moment to talk about my specialty, which is oral and maxillofacial radiology. Uh, back when I was applying for this residency program, which was around 2012, I could not find a lot of information about the residency program, uh, nor the people who have gone through this um, uh, residencies. The typical resources for many dentists or dental students looking for residency programs um, include sta uh, websites like Student Do Doctor Network. Uh, I used to use that program ex uh, quite a bit when I was applying to dental school, and wow, that was already 15 years ago. Um, but again, to this date, radiology residency still remains to be a relatively small uh, specialty program and there are many dental schools without having any board certified oral radiologist. So uh, in the next uh, several weeks or in the next several videos I want to take uh, some time to tell you more about my residency programs and my field in general as well as some of the reasons why you should or should not consider this specialty training. So for today's video, uh, I want to talk about programs, ADA accredited, accredited uh, programs in United States and Canada. As you can see on this website, you can go to abomr.org and you can get to this website uh, for the public under the public tab. You can see that there are 10 schools uh, within United States and Canada nine of which are located in the United States. One of them, the University of Toronto, is the only school uh, outside of the United States. What's interesting is of these 10 schools, um, about half of them started within the last 10 years. First of all, keep in mind that radiology, oral radiology, was not uh, recognized as a specialty until 1999, so it's been just over 20 years. So the number of uh, specialty training program is relatively still small. But the fact that there have been many schools that have been uh, opening up with their residency program just in the last 10 years is very suggestive um, of that this field has seen a lot of growth in the last 10 years. And I expect that growth to continue um, into the f near future as long as Kombim CT is being heavily utilized and continue to be utilized in, uh, in the field of dentistry. So let's go through the list. So UCLA which is a program that I graduated from back in 2015 that was this is also a relatively new program that it began it accepting uh, first class in 2012 and I started 2013, so I was a second class to graduate out of this program. Connecticut is uh, one of the uh, programs that has been long established. Uh, Florida, once again, is relatively new. I could be off one or two years, but I want to say that this program was uh, accredited around uh, 2014 or 15, a few years after UCLA. Iowa has been around for a long time and so is North Carolina. Again, Texas A&M, uh, Baylor College of Dentistry is relatively new. Um, I don't exactly know the year, but I, I want to say around 2016 or 2017 is when they began accepting their first resident. San Antonio has been around for a very long time. As a matter of fact, my oral radiologist, my faculty who taught me at the University of Colorado was from uh, or had gone through his training at UT San Antonio. Toronto has been around for a while and Stony Brook is again a relatively uh, new program. Mm, probably started right around 2017 or so um, and a very class close friend of mine who graduated at about the same time is now the director of this program. Um, I think this is a typo, typo, this should have been University of Washington, UW. Um, that program started around the same time that the UCLA program started, which was around 2013. 
So you can see there are many uh, programs, quite a few, almost half of the list, if that have started just within the last 10 years. All of these programs uh, are not exactly the same in terms of the degrees that, it, uh, that they offer. Some programs mandate that you go through their master's uh, degree, uh, probably master's of science, so that it's a three-year program, whereas some program is optional. Uh, they have an optional master's degree program. So should you choose to, you can just go through the two-year certificate program or two-and-a-half-year certificate program without getting master's degree. A couple other things to note is that um, the, the tuition or the uh, may vary greatly from school to school. So is the stipend. Some schools may require uh, you to pay tuition, whereas some schools will pay stipend for you to attend the school. Uh, for instance, my school, uh, UCLA, back when I attended, the stipend, there was no tuition, at least for someone who's from the United States from, uh, as a citizen. And the stipend back then was around 20000 And since then, they've increased their stipend quite a bit. And I haven't checked the latest figure, but I think it's in the range of about 50000 Also, uh, I believe that is the same case with the uh, University of Washington, where their stipend is uh, somewhere between, I think, fifty to 60000 You can obviously go to their website to find out. Um, so that it, it's not a lot of money, but it's you know enough to cover your uh, apartments and uh, uh, living you know, um, cost during your residency. Uh, what I do remember back when I was applying North Carolina, there was a, a tuition associated with it. I, I again, I, I don't exactly recall the top of my head, and things may have changed greatly since then. But again, tw back in 2012, uh, when I was applying, um, I believe there was like 20 to 30 thousand tuition that I had to pay annually had I uh, decide to. Um, attend this school. And so it's very important depending on your status whether you have the citizenship status or permanent residency or you're from out of the country you want to look into each of these programs carefully to see whether you're even eligible to apply to this program. And also tuition, stipend can vary greatly. A um, couple other things that I want to note is that uh, also the uh, the, the type of education, or let me put it this way, number of Combium CT scans that you will be seeing and reading and interpreting can vary greatly from school to school. Um, you can see that some of these schools are located in a very large urban area, like a big city such as UCLA, right, California, uh, Dallas, right, uh, San Antonio is relatively big, and obviously Toronto. But there are some schools that are located in, uh, much, um, I, let me just say, smaller cities, right? University of Iowa. And so depending on um, the size of the city or the size of the dental school, for that matter, that can greatly influence the number of CVCT scans that will go through each of these programs. Not only that, you have to look at what types of COMIM scans are um, allowed for the residents to uh, interpret and view. There are some schools that will have a centralized model, which means all Combeam CT scans are taken through the radiology department, such that the residents will be able to see essentially all Combeams taken at the dental school. And that was the case uh, at UCLA. Whereas some other schools may have multiple uh, Combeam CT, but with a decentralized model, meaning you may not have been able to see, or you may not be able to see all comb beams taken at the school, but only the ones that are either referred to a radiology department for interpretation. So that can uh, significantly impact uh, the type of education or type of scans that you're going to see. So just for instance, uh, this is just hypothetical situation. I, I do believe this is the case for one of these programs that you know endo department has its own COMIM CT and that they don't send all the scans to the radiologist. So what is your experience levels going to be uh, in reading endodontic scans? 
perhaps only the ones that they refer it to you and you're kind of at the mercy of uh, that's basically outside of your control right so the only other way perhaps you can increase your experience in endodontic scan may be that you have to rely on outside scans meaning the clinicians that are in private practice may be referring their scans to your program for you to or for the residents to interpret so that's another way to kind of uh, make up for the loss so to speak but I do think that's very important that um, where there are let me rephrase that I do think there are certain types of scans that are not easily referred from outside scans and that are and those are typically oral surgery related scans um, at least that's my opinion so it is a great idea uh, if you can find the program where you can see uh, scans from oral surgery program right they they are the department right they are the ones that will do a lot of biopsies and some radical uh, you know dissection or resection of the jaw and you know things like ameloblastoma I mean those are the case I think you you want to see and that can drastically improve your overall educational experience um, because you know I've been out in Nebraska for about last five years since 2015 and um, our oral surgery department is part of the medical school so I don't get to see oral surgery scans and my primary source of scans are from periodontics and endodontics which means if I recall correctly over the last four years or four to five years I don't think I've seen a single ameloblastoma case that came you know directly out of our perio clinic program there may have been a few that I have got to see you know that I had a chance to see through our pathologists who wanted to consult the cases with me but I don't think there was a single ameloblastoma however back in UCLA uh, my memory <laughs> if I recall correctly um, is that I was seeing ameloblastoma relatively frequent frequently frequent as in uh, every few months uh, uh, perhaps it might have been even more frequent than that every few months I was I would see ameloblastoma that were being taken care of our oral surgery program um, not just the ameloblastoma think of all the rare whether it's benign or malignant lesions um, that you can see through oral surgery so that I think was tremendously helpful for me to uh, be exposed to that uh, scan during my training not to mention things like osteonecrosis of jaw uh, was the scans that we would see I want to say almost weekly basis at UCLA but here again how often have I seen osteonecrosis of jaw um, not very frequently let me just put it that way so the quality of training the number of CBCT scans that you're gonna see can vary drastically from program to program and those are the things that I think you really have to either contact the program director or the residents that are in the program to find to gain more insight um, and so I, I think that's another very important thing for you to consider so those are some, some of the things that I, I can think of at this point as you are considering perhaps this specialty um, this I do think there's a, a lot of room for growth and let me uh, quickly jump over to AAOMR website that you can also try uh, explore AAOMR.org so if you go to this website uh, here the certificate program you can go through two or two and a half year program if not master's degree program with three years and there may be a f several programs that offer five year um, uh, programs with a PhD degree um, so yes uh, I certainly want you to explore this website um, if you want to know more about it and if you have any questions about the, uh, this specialty feel free to uh, email me directly or just leave a comment in the on the section below I'll try to respond whenever I can thank you very much and I will follow up with a couple more uh, videos on this specialty and take care bye